Man of Wedlock. We knew that Tom Rikus is on the uh, Pat Melrison show right now. And I We're listening think live. That the laws uh, have been brought up to date uh, with all of the new ways now of testing to find out if someone is a father. DNA testing specifically. Uh, we are way behind the times uh, with our laws in terms of what we do when we find out that someone is not the parent. Now, it, for less than $100, somebody can go to a drugstore and get one of these kits and establish pretty much yay or nay pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And But there are complications because there are so many partners involved. There's not only the man and the woman, there's the child, and there's the question of the biological father. How does this relationship work, and where do the courts usually go in this? Well, what happens in the courts, of course, is they talk about something called the best interests of the child. And this is, I think, one of the most abused phrases uh, in the legal world, the best interests of the child, because yeah, in many cases we're not talking about the best interests of the child, we're talking about states that have uh, budgets that have been cut, or tax revenues that have fallen, or people who are very upset about uh, anything from welfare to food stamps, whatever, and if they can get somebody else to pay some of the governmental uh, responsibility in these cases, uh, they're happy to get somebody even if he's not the rightful parent. Uh, so what happens is many times we say that something's going in the direction uh, of the father paying uh, or the, the presumed father paying simply because uh, the courts really don't have a good answer for what to do in these situations. And there is no, no great answer when it's gone that far. I do think uh, that, that this problem could be solved, and this was referred to in the Times article. Uh, by mandatory DNA testing at birth for every live birth. That would certainly reduce the cost of the DNA testing if it was done in that volume. And then we would know once and for all we would not have all of these tearful scenes that happen down the line. As we read in the New York Times piece there, the question of mandatory testing. Right now, a lot of women in the hospitals they make sure that they're monitored so that the children that they take home are their own children. There's all kinds of, uh, of identification. There are closed circuit cameras to make sure the child and mother are not separated. And the idea of mandatory testing to make sure that child and father are biologically related is one suggestion that's come up. Gloria Allred joins me, as I said, the feminist attorney and partner at Allred Morocco and Goldberg. Thank you for being here. Ooh, feminist. Thank you for having me. So what questions for you and your clients, or the people uh, who may become your clients, what questions does this qu uh, issue of uh, paternity, biological paternity, versus simply raising a child for years, thinking of it as your own, what do they bring up for you and your practice? Well, a good question is, was Tom Likas and I, were we separated at birth? That's the very <laughs> biggest question facing us today. Well, we can always uh, go to the drugstore and find out the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think this New York Times article, uh, in all seriousness, raises a very serious issue a very, and shows the complexity of the issue. I do think that um, it's really important to balance uh, the rights of everyone involved, and that, uh, I, for me, first and foremost, is always a child uh, versus the parents of the child. The child is the innocent victim in all of this, no matter what has happened. <clears throat> and uh, so I think that that's the reason that there has been a, at least a legal trend towards saying that if, you know, if the father or mother, but generally the, the father, if the father wants to challenge paternity, he should do so within the first two years of the child's birth um, because after that, if he has been acting as a father, bonding as the father, um, and he hasn't challenged it, and, but does so like many years later, that's very disruptive to the life of the child. I mean, just putting aside the finances and just looking at the emotions, it's very hard on the child. So I think that the rule that that, you know, he's he presumed to be the father, but uh, unless, but that's just a presumption he can challenge it, um, I think is an important rule. Tom's suggestion that uh, perhaps we should have mandatory DNA tests at the time of birth, um, that's something I would, I would seriously consider. But I would say that on the birth certificate, they should be very clearly told that they have the right to have a DNA test. And I think that also perhaps they should understand uh, and maybe be, be told that if they do not take a DNA test, then they are waiving or giving up the right to challenge paternity later, and, I, and that they should get an attorney to help them understand that if they wish, but that you have the right to give up that right. And, and I think that might be a way to go on all of this. 
All right, let's hear from one of our callers, and you can talk, call and talk about this yourself at 866-893-5722. Jeffrey's calling from Virginia. Jeffrey, thanks for your call. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Go ahead, you're on the air. All uh, right, uh, well, basically, uh, last November 1st, uh, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine had a child, uh, and uh, she called me about a week after he was born to let me know that she thought he was my child, and she said there was nobody else, and it kind of fit the timeline that we were dating. So, uh, you know, I spent a bunch of money uh, first just to try to do the honorable thing, start to take care of him. I bought cribs for both my house and her house, strollers, all that good stuff, and uh, I was supporting him, but in February, she decided that wasn't enough and took me to court for child support. And uh, that was fine, and at that point, you know, I said I wanted a DNA test just, just to make sure I wasn't really worried about it. Well, I uh, started paying child support. I paid it for four months before the DNA test came back. And when it came back, he wasn't mine. Uh, you know, I paid already a, a few thousand dollars. He was mm-hmm. part of our family. Uh, you know, my, my parents were devastated because they were the ones helping the babysit to take care of him for, you know, this, this ended in May. And, uh, you know, we've been taking care of him for the last seven months. So what are you and, doing and, now? Uh, well, now she, you know, after we found out, she up and moved to Ohio. And, uh, you know, it's still a lingering effect on me and my family that we had this baby. You know, I still have all the baby stuff, his crib, all the play toys. And, it's, you know, it's really hard on a father, or, you know, even a person who thinks he's a father, to take care of a child for six, seven months and just to find out that he's not yours and the mother just not even saying that there's a chance that he's not. If, if I would have thought there's a chance that he wasn't, you know, that would probably would have been the first thing I would have done is get a DNA test to make sure. So, Jeffrey, hang on and let's hear from, from the people on our on our panel here. Tom Likas, Jeffrey's experience is only a few months. Some fathers go several years thinking that a child is theirs who is, in fact, not biologically theirs. Well, Jeffrey is an example of how mandatory DNA testing is not only a matter of preventing people from paying obligations that are not theirs, but also from getting into the kind of emotional turmoil people get into, and they think they're parents, and then they think they're not parents. Uh, I, I, by the way, I want to go back to something Gloria said about mandatory DNA testing earlier, and that is uh, to give men the option of DNA testing and let them know, and I, I'm all in favor of making this uh, uh, you know, transparent and the, the people know what their rights are. The problem is if you're in a relationship uh, and you tell your wife or girlfriend, well, I'm going to have DNA tests done here to make sure that I am the father, it causes all kinds of turmoil in the home. This, it has to be mandatory from that point of view because men could be pressured into not getting the DNA test. And, and Gloria, I'll read a mandatory uh, um, ruling would make it easier, I suppose, on both parties so nobody feels pressured, nobody feels like you don't love me, you don't trust me. Is that the best way to go, is just lay down the law? Well, I, I think there's a strong argument uh, uh, in support in favor of that. I think it also uh, will be good for the child to know who their biological father is. Uh, I do want to point out there are some people, there are some fathers who, you know, they, they think of being a father as more than just a biological connection. Some fathers, and I, I, I knew one very well, and he knew biologically he was not the father, but he in fact was a de facto father and emotionally bonded with the child and continued to be a father and still is a father to the child, for the child's whole life. And, you know, loves the child despite the fact that he knows biologically he's not the father. I would also suggest it's a good idea, you know, that everybody should really think about contraception if they don't plan to be a parent, and uh, using that contraception rather than relying on the other person who says, "I can't get you pregnant" or "I can't get pregnant." That's always uh, the uh, the. Uh, that would be that would be the thing to do, and also to be really try to know your your partner as much as you can. That's always and, ideal. When we come back, we're going to be hearing more from Gloria Allred and Tom Likas. Exactly what is fatherhood? Is it bringing up a child? Is it being the biological parent? All these definitions as DNA cases are finding more and more that people are not the fathers of children they thought were theirs. You can call us with your stories at 866-893-KPCC.